in a series of personal crises seems insurmountable. You are being pulled apart in all directions. Yet this afternoon walk in the countryside slowly brings relaxation to your harried mind. The soil and strain of modern high-tech living begins to wash off in layers. That willow tree near the stream looks comfortable and inviting. The buzz of dragonflies and the whisper of the willow's swaying branches bring a deep peace. Searching inward for tranquility and happiness, you close your eyes. A high-pitched cascading sound like crystal wind chimes impinges on your floating awareness. As you open your eyes, you see a shimmering blueness rise from the ground. The sound seems to be emanating from this glowing portal. It is difficult to look at the blueness. Light seems to bend and distort around it while the sound waves become so intense they appear to become visible. The portal hangs there for a moment, then, with the rush of an imploding vacuum, it sinks into the ground. Something remains suspended in midair for a moment before falling to the earth with a heavy thud. Somewhat shaken by this vision, you rise to your feet to investigate. A crude circle of stones surrounds the spot where the portal appeared. There's something glinting in the grass. You pick up an amulet shaped like a cross with a loop on the top. It is an ankh, the sacred symbol of life and rebirth, but this could not have made the thud. So you look again and find a large book wrapped in thick cloth. With trembling hands, you unwrap the book. Behold, the cloth is a map, and within lies not one book, but two. The map is of a land strange to you, and the style speaks of ancient cartography. The script on the cover of the first book is arcane but readable. The title is The History of Britannia, as told by Kyle the Younger. The other book is disturbing to look at. Its small cover appears to be fashioned out of some sort of leathery hide, but from what creature is uncertain. The reddish-black skin radiates an intense aura, suggestive of ancient power. The tongue of the title is beyond your ken. You dare not open the book and disturb whatever sleeps within. You decide to peruse the history. Settling back under the willow tree, you open the book. Chapter 1, Political History. The Dark Ages of Britannia is the name given to that long span of time when the infamous triad of evil stalked the lands and challenged all for the supremacy of the soul. The first era of the Dark Ages came to an end with the downfall of the evil wizard Mondain and his many minions as chronicled in Ultima I. 
the lords of the lands were weak and scattered, rendered ineffective by factional wars. It was only through the valiant efforts of one itinerant adventurer that the foul mundane was tracked to his hidden lair and slain. But a few years of restless peace followed Mondain's downfall. So long had the world shuddered beneath Mondain's yoke that many found it hard to believe that he had really been vanquished. In truth, his teachings did not disappear. Mondain's apprentice, Minax, rose to power soon thereafter to challenge the fledgling city-states that were beginning to evolve. The terrors had begun anew. Minax's powers upon maturity greatly exceeded those of her evil mentor. With these powers, she was able to rain wholesale destruction upon the planet, twisting and corrupting everything. Her foul web spread throughout time itself, ensnaring all who sought to oppose her. Finally, there arose a hero out of legend who dared face Minax in her own fiery castle and destroy her. Thus ended the second era of darkness, as told in Ultima II. Twenty years of well-earned tranquility ensued and prosperity favored the land. Then disturbing omens appeared, followed by the mysterious appearance of a fiery island. The tale of the third era of the Dark Ages is told by Iolo the Bard in Ultima III, wherein Lord British, sovereign of an incipient empire in the land of Sosaria, called forth through time and space for heroes of the people to assemble. Four diverse adventurers answered this clarion call. To them fell the Gius of the Doom of Exodus. Long they labored on the trail of the mysterious exodus, through many a deep dungeon which seared their souls. To this day, each member of that team bears the marks of their journey. With the aid of the mystical Time Lord, they were successful in bypassing the great Earth Serpent and gaining access to Exodus's island fortress. The very bricks of the fortress rose up against them, and great is the bard's tale of their struggle to reach their mortal foe. Of the final confrontation, not one of them will speak, save to say that the evil is gone from this plane. So passed the third member of the triad of evil, and with this death, so passed the dark ages of Britannia. From the rubble of Sosaria, Lord British was able to unite all the mainland and a few of the islands under his rule. This new empire of Britannia brought much sought after peace and prosperity to its subjects. Many of the ancient pockets of evil were destroyed, so that the only remaining hazard to wayfarers was the occasional stray band of marauding orcs or hill giants. Most of the lands were mapped though a few unexplored regions still remain. With the triad of evil destroyed, Lord British became known for his dedication to raising the quality of life of his subjects. To assist in this endeavor, three mighty structures were raised in the distant parts of the realm. One was the Lycaeum, wherein lay the great observatory, Another was the Empath Abbey with its oak groves where wise men and women meditated upon the teachings of the ancients. The third structure was the great castle of the Knight's Order of the Silver Serpent. Only the flower of Lord British's chivalry was invited to join this order, which embodied the highest ideals and exemplary bravery. The rest of the land was divided among eight major towns each with its own political faction. Numerous satellite villages also dotted the countryside between the towns. In this manner were Lord British's lands organized. Closing the book, you again pick up the Ankh. As you hold it, you begin to hear a hauntingly familiar, 
lute-like sound wafting over a nearby hill. Still clutching the strange artifacts, you rise unbidden and climb the slope. In the valley below you, you see what appears to be a fair. It seems strange that you came that way earlier and noticed nothing. As you mull this over, your feet carry you down towards the site. This is no ordinary traveling carnival, but a renaissance fair. The pennants on the tent tops blow briskly in the late afternoon breeze. The ticket taker at the Ren Fair's gate starts to ask you for money, but upon spotting your ankh says, Welcome friend, enter in peace and find your path. The music continues to pull you forward amongst the merchants and vendors. Glimpses of fabulous treasures can be seen in some of the shadowy booths. These people are very happy. They seem to glow with an inner light. Some look up as you pass and smile, but you cannot stop. The music compels you to move onward through the crowd. Through the gathering dusk, you see a secluded gypsy wagon sitting off in the woods. The music seems to emanate from the wagon. As you draw near, a woman's voice weaves into the music, saying, You may approach, O seeker. You enter to find an old gypsy sitting in a small curtained room. She wears an ankh around her neck. In front of her is a round table covered in deep green velvet. The room smells so heavily of incense that you feel dizzy. Seeing the Ankh, the ancient gypsy smiles and warns you never to part with it. We have been waiting such a long time, but at last you have come. Sit here and I shall read the path of your future. Upon the table she places a curious wooden object like an abacus, but without beads. In her hands, she holds eight unusual cards. Let us begin the casting. The gypsy places the first two cards upon the table. They are the cards of sacrifice and humility. She says, consider this. Thou art an elderly, wealthy eccentric. Thy end is near. Dost thou a donate all thy wealth to feed hundreds of starving children and receive pa public adulation, or b. humbly live out thy life, willing thy fortune to thy heirs. A. The gypsy places two more of the cards upon the table. They are the cards of honesty and compassion. She says, consider this. Entrusted to deliver an uncounted purse of gold, thou dost meet a poor beggar. Dost thou, A, deliver the gold knowing the trust in thee was well placed, or B, show compassion, giving the beggar a coin knowing it won't be missed? A. The gypsy places two more of the cards upon the table. They are the cards of justice and spirituality. She says, consider this. Thou dost believe that virtue resides in all people. Thou dost see a rogue steal from thy Lord. Dost thou A, call him to justice, or B, personally try to sway him back to the spiritual path of good? B. The gypsy places two more of the cards upon the table. They are the cards of valor and honor. She says, consider this. During battle, thou art ordered to guard thy commander's empty tent. The battle goes poorly, and thou dost yearn to aid thy fellows. Dost thou, A, valiantly enter the battle and aid thy companions, or B, honor thy po post as a guard? It's an empty tent. Aid. The gypsy places two more of the cards upon the table. They are the cards of valor 
and spirituality. Consider this. A local bully pushes for a fight. Dost thou a. valiantly trounce the rogue, or b. decline, knowing in thy spirit no lasting good will come of it? b. The gypsy places two more of the cards upon the table. They are the cards of honesty and spirituality. No, sacrifice. She says, consider this. Thee and thy friend are valiant but penniless warriors. Thou both go out to slay a mighty dragon. Thy friend thinks he slew it. Thee did. When asked, dost thou a. truthfully claim the gold, or b. allow thy friend to take the large reward? b. The gypsy places the last two cards upon the table. They are the cards of sacrifice and spirituality. She says, consider this. Thou hast spent thy life in charitable and righteous work. Thine uncle, the innkeeper, lies ill and asks you to take over his tavern. Dost thou a. sacrifice thy life of purity to aid thy kin, or b. decline and follow thy spirit's call? Yeah. B. With the final choice, the incense swells up around you. The gypsy speaks as if from a great distance, her voice growing fainter with each word. So be it! Thy path is chosen! There is a moment of intense, wrenching vertigo. As you open your eyes, a voice whispers within your mind, Seek the counsel of thy sovereign. After a moment, the spinning subsides, and you open your eyes to... Welcome to Let's Play Ultima 4 Quest of the Avatar. Let's begin the adventure, shall we? Just going into uh, Scarabray here. Now, a large part of this game is uh, conversation. Although there is action involved in it, in terms of uh, role-playing role turn-based combat, the real uh, action is uh, in discovering the, the plot and the goal through talking to the various residents of Britannia and learning about their problems and uh, the best ways of uh, actually uh, solving uh, those uh, problems virtuously. Okay, let's talk to this person. You meet a solemn ranger. He says, I am Shamino. Okay. Shamino, what's your job? I seek the inner light. How's your health? I am well. Light? I seek the one great truth. Oh? Truth. That which lies within the codex. Codex. Okay, you can't tell me more. Not a problem. Well, good day to you, Shamino. Thank you for the aid. All right. Talk. You meet a wise mage. He says, I am Carlisle. Okay, Carlisle, what's your job? I write magic. Dost thou believe in magic? Yes. Magic missiles need but one part ash. Oh, thank you. How's your health? Oh, I'm fine. Okay. Have a good day, Carlisle. Hello. You meet a gallant fighter. 
uh, can I get your name? He says, I am white. Interesting. What's your job? I quest. Oh. Many quests are very dangerous. Art thou fearless in all things? To be honest, no. Danger is real. No danger is real. Okay. All right. Uh, white. That I cannot help you with. Okay, health. Excellent. Thank you. Bye. Talk. You meet a wise bard. He says, I'm Dickens. Nice to meet you, Dickens. I write stories. That's actually pretty interesting. Okay, so we know your job now. What, how's your health? Oh, it's okay. Can you tell me a little bit about stories? Stories are good for the spirit. Tell me more. Remember, no one is useless in this world who lightens the burdens of others. Art thou good in nature? I think so. Be sure thy net good exceeds thy net evil. Thank you. Hey, what's down here? You meet a short, dumpy man with a book. Can I get your name? He says, I am Ramasco. Well, what's your job, Ramasco? I am a teacher. I enrich young minds. Uh-huh. Enrich. Uh, minds. Okay. Health. I'm fine. Okay. Teacher, maybe. I teach of the abyss. Know ye of the abyss? Right now? No. Learn. Thank you. Bye. Talk. You meet an injured man. Uh, what's your name? I am Emerson. What's your job, Emerson? I seek the spiritual path. Oh? So do I. Spiritual is stronger than any material force. Strong? Okay, um, material, maybe. Force. Okay, well, that is pretty interesting. How's your health? I am grievously wounded. Yeah, yeah, I'm really sorry about that, man. Uh, bye, you have a good day. You meet a great philosopher. He says, I am Buddha, and I am honored. What's your job, Buddha? I teach. What do you teach? When one has pity on all living creatures, then one is noble. Noble? If one speaks or acts with pure thought, happiness will follow like a shadow that never leaves. 
Mm. Happiness. Mm. Thought. Shadow. Now, I don't see where to continue this conversation for now, so I'll ask him his health. I am well. All right, Buddha, it was a pleasure meeting you. You have yourself a great day. Now, let me see. Okay, my food supplies are going well. Uh huh. What's up here? Hi. You meet a small child. He says, I am barren. What's your job? I don't have a job. Okay. Um, how's your health? Okay. I am not sure how to proceed from here, so have a great day. Hi. You meet a tall ranger. Uh, what's what's your name? He says I am Santiana. Okay, interesting. Um, what's your job, Santiana? I carry the light within my heart. Light. The light of philosophy. Philosophy? You're like that Buddha guy we met a minute ago. In philosophical minds, the familiar excites wonder. Oh. Dost thou always tread the right path? I have to admit, no. You can, but strive to do so. Thank you. Um... Check something here. Yeah. Well, thank you. Hi. You meet a skilled ranger. He says, I am Michelangelo. Hi, Michelangelo. How you doing? I strive along the path. Art thou far along the path? Uh, no. Fear not, thou shalt be. Oh, thank you. Tell me about this path. Success is a journey, not a destination. Tell me about the journey. May thou always desire more than thou can accomplish. Okay, uh, destination. Okay. Desire. Accomplish. I'm not sure what to make of that, but thank you. I'm guessing it will mean something later. All right, let me go here and just take a look at be on this door. I don't think there's anything I can do in there yet. So what's down here to the south, if anything? <sighs> All right. Mm. I think I covered it all. That's Buddha. Yeah, I've talked to everybody here. That's a, a start. That this will be our introductory episode. I will uh, 
definitely uh, come back and uh, continue this a bit later. Uh, for next episode, what I'm probably going to do next is uh, show you a demo of combat so you can see how uh, fights uh, work in the game. And also, we'll demo the Moongate system, which is uh, the fast travel in this game. It's pretty handy as long as you understand how uh, the moons interact. Right there, we got a moon gate open, but I'm not going to take it. All right. So for now, I'll save the game. And uh, I will uh, see you next time. If uh, you enjoyed it, please like, comment, and subscribe. Have a great day.